All right, I'm here with uh, Dr. Paul Arena, uh, professor of biological sciences at Nova Southeastern University and Florida master naturalist, so probably the perfect person to talk to about uh, all of this uh, invasive species. Mm -hmm. So um, how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really interested and passionate about this topic, so uh, excited to, to chat about uh, invasives. All right, so first, um, what is an invasive species? You know, what makes yeah. a species invasive? Yeah, it's always good to kind of define some terms before you dive into the topic. So obviously we first should define what a native is. Mm. Uh, when we talk about invasives, it usually relates to exotic or non-indigenous species. But first we should think, well, what is a native species? And it's been defined a couple different ways. Um, one way is a species that's evolved in the natural habitat. Um, and some definitions include that was there before European occupation mm. of North America. So essentially pre 1500s, uh, if it was in that habitat at that time, it's considered native. Uh, exotics are those species that were brought in usually um, and they are not native. They didn't evolve in that habitat. They were either introduced or accidentally uh, show up in that habitat. And then we can take that a step further and talk about invasive species, which are typically exotics that really proliferate uh, abundantly and then start to change the ecosystem uh, in a negative way. You know, they, they cause harm to that ecosystem by being there. Okay, so what is the difference essentially between like, let's say an exotic, like um, if I planted like a rose bush in my front yard uh, compared to like water hyacinth, which is just annihilating <coughs> all the uh, the canals and the and the lakes around here. Yeah, um, good point. You know, there are big differences there. It all relates to this effect of harming the environment. Uh, turns out we have tons of exotics, you know, throughout Florida, throughout the country. But most of those species that have been introduced to a new habitat don't typically become invasive, don't cause harm. Uh, if you think about even just our national agricultural system, just about every agricultural crop we grow today, even the, you know, the typical American apple uh, <laughs> is not native to North America. Uh, if you talk about Florida, our state fruit is the orange. It's not native uh, to Florida at all. Um, however, it's not invasive. We don't typically see you know, wild apples growing everywhere, taking over, same thing with the oranges. So an invasive really has to have some sort of advantage um, where it proliferates to the point where it totally takes over. Sometimes it'll remove nutrients that natives require. Sometimes it'll outcompete natives. Sometimes it'll predate natives. Uh, all of those things and, and the proliferation of that particular species and ultimately the displacement of natives and kind of the disruption of the natural processes in these ecosystems can lead to this invasive potential. So what about naturalization? Yeah, naturalization particularly um, uh, focuses on the ability of an exotic to reproduce on its own in nature. That's really all naturalized means. Mm. So some exotics, like that rosebush you mentioned, yeah, yeah. it's possible that it could spread and, and reproduce on its own. Uh, however, just because it's naturalized doesn't necessarily mean it'll become invasive. Uh, so it could potentially propagate. That's really, again, what naturalization is. It's propagating on its own in nature without the help of humans. Sometimes though that that will lead to you know an invasive species, but not all the time. So that's why some ornamental plants that people will have in like their you know front yards and such, they're exotic, but they can't really get naturalized because they don't essentially have the ability to to jump beyond. You know, yeah, they can't they can't survive without humans essentially uh, directly uh, taking care of them. Yeah, it's there's some estimates that of all the exotic species we have, about five to twenty percent can become invasive. And so, like I said, agricultural crops are a great example. A lot of our landscaping, ornamental species, yeah, yeah. you know, we plant them because they look pretty um, or they provide some sort of burst of color, whether it's the leaf or the flower, may not lead, you know, to an invasive species. But unfortunately, that does turn out to be the case many times, especially around, if you do a lot of hiking in natural areas here in South Florida, what you notice is the invasion of many of these ornamentals that people plant oh. in their gardens and landscapes. And, you know, particularly since everything's so urbanized here, the natural areas we have are these small little islands of, you know, vegetation surrounded by communities that have planted these ornamentals. And so they very quickly encroach in the natural area. So 
how, how can some of these uh, exotics become invasive? Because you'd imagine, like, as you mentioned before, in, in the, when you defined the term of, you know, a native versus, you know, the exotic versus invasive, that what sort of evolved in that area. So it seems that a, a species that's coming to an area where it's not essentially evolved for should actually have a disadvantage um, as opposed to being able to have this sort of explosive uh, growth and, and dominance that we see with some of these exotics or invasives. So yeah. how are they able to, considering they're not evolved for this environment, how are they able to have such an advantage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it, it's the evolutionary uh, mismatch, mm -hmm. right? Where, you know, you're getting to a new space. Can you survive there? You know, likely not because it's a new environment. You didn't adapt. You didn't evolve there for long periods of time. And so maybe you don't have the right nutrients. Maybe they're, um, maybe the temperature gradient's not going to, you know, be ideal for your survival. Um, so many different potential reasons for that. Maybe the prey item you need is, isn't there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so it, that kind of goes back to this estimate that, you know, again, only 5 to 20 percent actually get established because of that. You know, yeah, we're introducing a lot of uh, exotics, but they're not all taking hold because of those, that kind of mismatch of the environment and its capabilities uh, and in its adaptations. Um, but again, there, there's a whole other, you know, opposite end of the, the spectrum there. Why do they become invasive? Why do we have, you know, up to 20% of them becoming invasive? Because everything is right. Uh, you know, the environmental conditions are such that it can survive there just fine. And then you're kind of removing all the other controls in their native habitat so they don't have their predators here. You know, they don't have their parasites here. Um, the native species here haven't co-evolved to compete with them directly. So there's so many reasons that they kind of uh, escape the, the natural controls and can become invasive even faster. So the idea is kind of like uh, enemy escape or enemy release, I think, has been yes. referred to as, yep. yeah, you might be in a new environment, and you might know how to deal with these competitors or even potential predators, but at the same time, things don't know about you. They don't know how to handle those, ex uh, you particularly if you're invasive. So you might escape uh, predators, I guess, and then you're not coming over here with your diseases. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so you can see that, I guess, the downside or why a lot of them aren't successful, yeah, is because they're not ideally suited for the environment, but yeah, at the same time, um, they could escape, again, you said some of these natural controls that sort of let them sort of run amok. Yeah, and you know, we're in a unique situation here in Florida where a lot of those negatives that we talked about, why don't they become invasive, you know, again, only 5 to 20 percent do. It's a little bit of a different situation here in Florida. Uh, Florida's an ideal habitat for a lot of species to survive. You don't have, you know, deep freezes at all. Uh, pretty much from central South Florida, you have a less than 50% chance of experiencing a freeze. Yeah. And that, you know, freezing temperatures are, are really an important control on the distribution of populations around the world. We don't have to worry about that here. So it's just like, okay, you know, come on in. I'm not gonna have to worry about that temperature gradient and I'll be able to survive just fine year round. So kind of like the same notion of why you have greater biodiversity near like the equator essentially yeah. uh, than you do near the pole. Same thing essentially applies, mm -hmm. I guess, for invasives. So you, Absolutely. As a general rule, you probably would expect more inv invasives, be more likely to establish, I guess, as you get closer to the equator. Yeah, here in Florida, for instance, we've got 900 exotic species of plants <laughs> that are for sale um, through Home Depot, other nurseries, you know, that kind of thing. Of those 900 that are for sale, it's estimated that 400 have become invasive. Oh. So that's almost 50% here in Florida compared to that 5 to 20% global average. So it, it's definitely an invasive mecca here. You know, that's, it's, it's interesting because I was just walking to the grocery store the other day, Trader Joe's, mm -hmm. and they had water hyacinth uh, for sale right outside, oh, and that was goodness. one of the most invasive species in Florida yeah and it was kind of funny because it's cheap you know nice little glass containers sitting in there and I could only think of wow this could contribute to the invasive problem and also you can just go out to the canal and grab some <laughs> water hyacinth anyway yeah. you don't you don't have to actually go to the store to, uh, to purchase it yes that's un yeah that's unfortunate they shouldn't actually be selling <laughs> class one invasive <laughs> at, the, at Trader Joe's so aside from uh, this sort of mild climate um, encouraging invasive species or allowing for uh, invasive species more so than, than other areas. 
what what else contributes to the invasive species problem, particularly here in like Florida? Mm -hmm. Well, development is a big one. Uh, you know, more people. We're the third most populous state in the country now. People are coming here faster than they've ever been before and more people means more development more development means more disturbed habitats you know we're clearing areas building um, we have so many right-of-way areas along major highways or a main uh, around some of the uh, the railways too and these become pretty much a spot that invasives can can invade take take foothold and it becomes a source population so that they continue to spread to different areas and uh, unfortunately these kind of particularly these right away areas or in the middle of a developmental project there's nobody monitoring that there's nobody controlling those invasives so they can really become established and and again proliferate pretty easily so it's kind of this problem of not just their initial introduction but these these urbanized areas or developed areas are kind of constantly sort of feeding uh, this these these populations so like re constantly reintroducing them to the uh, to the area yeah that and and also whenever you kind of build somewhere else new you're you're destroying what was there so you're removing the native uh, diversity which means now there's all these opportunities these new niches you know uh, new nutrients available that an invader can come in and say hey you know I don't even have to compete with with even natives here yeah um, I could just take a foothold so yeah it's definitely a combination of those things and I even heard things about, you know, the pet trade. Oh, um, pet trade is huge down here. Uh, it has been for many years, you know, both in uh, the aquaria trade, mm -hmm. but also, you know, vertebrate pet trade, lizards, um, you know, any kind of exotic animal. Uh, we have one of the biggest pet trade areas in the country down here. And what happens there is really kind of a, a side effect of hurricanes and storms you know, which are prevalent down in, in Florida. They'll come down here and pretty much just wipe out a store, a pet shop and uh, destroy the shop. And of course, all those uh, species are released, uh, sometimes unintentionally due to those storm events. Uh, other times, you, you know, an, an owner might buy, let's say a Burmese Python, you know, you get it, it's pretty small. It's only like a foot long. That thing can grow up to 20 feet. So once it gets six, seven feet, people are like, huh, I don't know if I can handle this giant snake anymore. And it, they've become attached like you do with any pet. Mm -hmm. You don't want to kill it. Uh, so you just let it go. You know, okay, you know, go enjoy the wild here and survive. And, you know, that's a terrible thing, but uh, it happens very commonly. And it's a constant reintroduction of these invasives into the environment. And, and not only that, but the fish trade too. You know, when, mm -hmm. when hurricanes come in here, you lose power, sometimes for weeks, and you might have a really nice tank set up with these nice exotic species, and they're gonna die unless you can do something about it. And we have so many canals around South Florida that people are just very prone to say, I'm just gonna pour it out here so that they can make it. I don't wanna see this whole thing dying. And, and that again, constant reintroductions of these exotics into our waterways. And one of the most uh, dangerous or most damaging exotic species is the lionfish. Yeah. Uh, and that, time. Uh, uh, ironically was was considered almost as delicate species when you have in your aquarium at, at home. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems we have in the marine environment right now. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, research studies have shown that 90% of juvenile reef fish are being decimated by the lionfish. Oh. Uh, again, they're not used to this predator. It's a brand new predator. Uh, so they don't have any kind of escape adaptations or defensive adaptations that have evolved for it. Uh, the other thing is uh, like many invaders that can easily take a, a foothold is that they are toxic, uh, right? They're poisonous. So mm -hmm. e even predators can't eat these things typically because they can get toxic effects. So uh, it, talk about an enemy release, you yeah. know, there's not much that's controlling their populations out there. And uh, it's, it's a huge problem. But one of the interesting things while we're talking about lionfish as far as how do you manage invasives and, and one that's really working pretty well for lionfish it's just kind of taking uh, just, just starting to take off is the fact that we can market this as a food item mm -hmm. uh, lionfish fillets are actually delicious delicious it's a nice white flaky fish and even though they have these toxic spines or venomous spines you can easily just cut them off and then fillet the fish uh, without any kind of danger of you being envenomated 
and we're starting to see it in places like Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. Oh, nice. And this is like, this probably one of the smartest ways to control an invader because uh, as you know, humans, we love to overexploit things. Mm -hmm. You know, our grouper, our snapper, even Mahi Mahi now is becoming overexploited because we love to eat it so much. So if you could say, hey, this thing is delicious, go eat it. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hit that population pretty hard. <laughs> oh, the thing, one of the things that um, we have trouble with are driving species to extinction. Actually, so it's kind of an ironic problem when we have this invasive species and you go, oh, we can't get rid of this this in invasive species, <laughs> yet we just you know wiped out the passenger pigeon, which was you know one of the most abundant species uh, of birds on the planet. Yeah. that's a bird that can fly to an island and just hide somewhere, and we just knocked all of them out. Yeah. So, yeah, and another kind of along that same idea of control, uh, another way we're, we're kind of harvesting an invader, and this is kind of novel too, is with the Malaluka. Uh, the Malaluka is a, a tree that was introduced in the early 1900s from Australia mm -hmm. to help drain the Everglades. You know, again, back then it was, nobody really considered Florida to be a great spot to, to go to, to live, to thrive, for humans to, to really proliferate. But there were some people who said, no, you know, we could drain this really watery marshland and, and make productive agricultural land and develop, you know, lots of industries and so on. And the Maluka was brought in to do that. And of course, hindsight's 2020. <laughs> now we're spending billions of dollars trying to control the Maluka's spread throughout the Everglades. And um, so where am I going with this? Well, we've, we figured out that if we can sell a mulch variety called Malaluca mulch or flora mulch it's sold as, and encourage landowners to use that instead of what's kind of, kind of most commonly used is cypress mulch. And cypress mulch damages our native plants. Yeah, we need and, the know, cypress We trees. need the cypress, you know, cypress is being destroyed uh, all over the state. We could shift that to a Malaluca then there you go. You know, it's going to increase. It's going to start a market. Could go harvest that and actually make money. So th those types of strategies uh, seem to be working pretty well. So you mentioned Malaluca, and yeah. that was brought in to drain the Everglades, to purposely sort of ruin the Everglades. Yes, purposeful um, introduction. So how are invasive species, again, like the Malaluca, how are they uh, harming sort of Florida's natural areas, such as the Everglades? Yeah. Uh, well, we could talk about another one called Australian pine. This one was, uh, again, brought in intentionally, planted along the coast uh, as a windbreak, and it also it, it prevents erosion along the coast too, so when you get big hurricanes and so on. But it's starting to now proliferate in the, <laughs> uh, the Everglades marsh. So Everglades is an oligotrophic environment, very low nutrients. Everything there is adapted to it. Of, of course, the sawgrass that dominates mm -hmm. um, throughout most of the marshland is oligotrophic adapted. Um, now, the Australian pine has a unique feature. It's got these uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria in its roots. So it doesn't really need a whole lot of nutrients to survive. It pr the bacteria are providing its own nutrients. Uh. And so it get, once it gets established in that marshland, it really starts to proliferate and spread and displace that, uh, that sawgrass. And it actually has another adaptation that's important for an evader. Um, it, it undergoes something called allelopathy. So it actually produces this compound that is found in its leaves and its roots that entrains in the soil and prevents other plants from growing. So that is another thing that most allelopathic plants that are in their native range have other plant species that have evolved with it and that allelopathic chemical doesn't affect them as much. Um. But here, the plants haven't evolved with these Australian pines, and so the allelopathic chemical really is uh, productive and definitely, you know, limits the uh, the germination of other plants nearby. And that's kind of like a positive uh, frequency dependence. Um, so essentially, that basically means that the more of, of a of a population that's there, more individuals that are there, is actually the greater their advantage. I call it the Ali effect. But allelopathy would be just like that. You know, mm -hmm. the individuals themselves. Um, will drive out their competitors. The more that they are there, the better off they are. Essentially, they're kind of constructing their own niche yeah. and, and elbowing others out of there. What about things like um, how we're contributing to the problem? Maybe not by bringing in invasive species, but 
by some of our practices can actually help the invaders. Like you mentioned that the Everglades is a, is a low nutrient system or a, the, the, the natives there are adapted for this sort of low nutrient environment. Mm -hmm. um, but through say agricultural runoff uh, and such, are we introducing more uh, nutrients to the Everglades that, that's actually favoring uh, exotics or favoring, even if it's not exotics, might be favoring yep. some natives uh, like cattails, I believe. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are do well in high nutrient conditions, but don't do as well in low nutrient mm -hmm. conditions where the sawgrass. So even though it's not invasive cattails, right. um, we're simply causing a, we're still shifting the balance uh, in the ecosystem. So yeah. So, so cattails are native to South Florida, but we can talk about, there are some interesting exceptions where a native can actually become invasive. Mm -hmm. uh, we have love vine, for instance, is one, it's a native, but it can really take over and smother other plants. It's a parasite, but the cattails too. The cattails, again, like you said, they thrive in eutrophic conditions, lots of nutrients. That's what we're starting to see uh, with this water being discharged in the Everglades, and that's switching the balance from sawgrass dominated to more cattails. And that really changes the environment. It degrades the natural cycle for sure, because cattail and sawgrass are not like a one-to-one -one exchange of a plant. Uh, the, the cattails become a lot more dense. Mm. Um, they can actually block light to the water. Th that reduces photosynthesis, you know, algal growth, etc. can cause anoxic conditions in the water. Uh, you know, not a whole lot of oxygen. So not much survives in a cattail prairie. Uh, uh, it's also very difficult to get through. You wouldn't be able to hike through a dense you know, uh, prairie of cattails. You just can't get through it. And same thing with, you know, native uh, fauna, uh, you know, uh, bobcats, panthers, uh, deer. Uh, they just can't travel through that stuff. Really, the only thing that does well in a cattail area are crayfish. Um, they like that kind of habitat, but other, everything else, you see the diversity decline tremendously when that happens. And then kind of also along the lines of what's happening uh, with this increased nutrient flow into the Everglades, you know, one way we're trying to manage this is through the use of STA, stormwater treatment areas, mm -hmm. where the agricultural runoff goes in there first, and then it's it's treated in a sense, it's a biological control. We plant plant species in there that absorb those nutrients. Uh. And that actually, those STAs have been found to really be huge sources of invasives too. Because <laughs> you're starting with this nutrient pulse and that nutrient pulse is gonna really allow the plants to go wild. And then all those plants are eaten by other things, some of which are invaders, particularly blue tilapia. Mm. Uh, now tilapia is another fish species you'll see in every store. It, it was farm raised primarily uh, in aquaculture facilities. They've escaped into our canals due to hurricanes. Those aquaculture facilities damaged and tilapia escape into the canals. And now they're pretty much everywhere, particularly in these STAs. Uh, they, they were actually planting submerged aquatic vegetation in the STA to again, bring, to pull out more of those nutrients. Yeah. And they noticed that some of these STAs had all of that submerged aquatic vegetation it was just disappearing. And then they went in and they started to see that essentially it was chock full of blue tilapia, which is an herbivore. Yeah. And it was, Just you know, hurting the STA's everything. functionality. <laughs> so they actually had to drain down one of these STA's and killed millions of these tilapia. Oh man, hopefully had a big barbecue after that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, nice. I know. Uh, well, a lot of the birds, the, the wading birds really went Took hog wild that. on that, yeah. So another thing you kind of, um, bring it up a little bit with this this high nutrient water when that gets sort of dumped out on the coast then that can also facilitate algal blooms mm -hmm. so yep. um, I'm sure individuals that particularly in Florida even around the country have heard about these these big toxic algal blooms that are stinky and kind of really really ruining some vacation spots and some beaches oh, yeah. for people in local uh, neighborhoods and that again they always like to say hey these are natural cycles, these boom and bust population cycles of, these, of, these al of the algae, mm -hmm. which certainly is the case. Sure. Um, but when they're fed extra nutrients, it causes right. them to have more pronounced sort of explosions and growth. So another yep. example exactly. where it's a natural process right. and it's an, in a, in a basically a, a regular occurring species, a native species. Mm -hmm. um, however, when given this um, extra nutrient load, um, yep. then it can actually cause those cycles Big to time. become more damaging. So a native, Again, by, by through skewing yep. um, the environment can actually cause a 
mismatch or an imbalance in the uh, in the ecosystem. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned um, storm treatment areas, stormwater treatment areas. What are some other ways that we're trying to cut down invasive species? What are yeah. some basic? There's um, a, there's a quite you know we we try to attack this problem at all fronts because it is such a big problem. Uh, one natural way that invasives are controlled is actually through fire. A lot of the ecosystems here in South Florida mm -hmm. are fire dependent. And of course, you know, before we started to suppress fires, you know, fire bad, you know, we don't want our, our urban communities to burn up. These fires would naturally occur. You know, Florida used to be the lightning capital of the world. We're, we're second now, but that's how those fires would have started. Mm -hmm. And they would have spread through the natural areas and, and killing off a lot of species that would not have been able to survive a fire, particularly invasives. You know, things from other areas, they're not going to be fire adapted most of the time. The species that are there, they have adapted with fire and, and some of them require fire. Mm -hmm. But again, because of this fire suppression, unfortunately, a lot of invaders are, are taking foothold in our natural areas. Okay. And we try to undergo what we call prescribed burns. Because of the small nature of natural areas and you really have to have the right conditions, you know, the wind has to be right, you don't want smoke blowing on roadways and so on, um, they're not occurring as often as they should. So that's one way. Uh, of course, you have the typical chemical treatment, mm -hmm. right? If it's a plant, apply herbicide. Uh, if it's a, an animal or an insect, apply a pesticide. You know, so there's, there's some issues with that, obviously, because some of those things can wash into your local waterways and affect mm -hmm. non-targeted species. Uh, but that's done in some cases. In some cases, it works pretty effectively. Uh, like, for instance, the Malaluca, very difficult to kill these things. Um, we've tried just chopping them all down, but the root system is so robust, it come right back. So really, the only way to deal with the Malaluca is to um, girdle them and then apply glyphosate, I think that's what it's called, uh, <laughs> this herbicide right around into the, the uh, vascular tissue and that kills them. But it's super labor intensive and really costly I to can do imagine. that. So, you know, we're trying to find other ways. And uh, some other ways is actually to use biological control agents. So, okay, where does this invader come from? You know, obviously it had enemies there that were controlling its abundance. So look at those natural uh, habitats of these invaders and see what is controlling them and try to bring those in here and release them into our environment. Now that there's a lot of course problems and you know scary things that could potentially happen there. You, you don't first of all you don't just do that. It, it is a whole rigorous year long multi year long testing that has to occur cuz you don't want to release something that is not going to actually affect your targeted invader right if it's going to start affecting the other natives then you've caused a bigger problem uh, and uh, unfortunately we have some experience with that here <laughs> in Florida too uh, and if you're from Florida you probably know about the cane toad issues uh, turns out not only has Florida had to deal with these cane toads but so is Australia oh it's brutal same there. exact time in the 30s Florida and Australia introduced this cane toad, which is from South America, into sugarcane fields. That's where the name comes from, mm -hmm. because there was a beetle that was affecting the sugarcane productivity, and somebody had this brilliant idea. Well, let's get a toad to go out and eat these things. And uh, the cane toad was known to eat beetle larvae and beetles, uh, and, and so they released it. Unfortunately, it didn't see the, the sugarcane boundaries, right? It, it, did eat some beetles in the sugar canes, but then very quickly spread out into local areas. And now it's a huge problem. So essentially throughout the entire state, we'll probably never get, a, uh, get that thing removed. And the issues with those cane toads is that they have these huge parotid glands and they're extremely toxic. Mm -hmm. Now we have a species, the southern toad, it's very similar looking. It's got these ridges on its head. Uh, it doesn't get as big as the cane toad, but it's not as toxic. It doesn't, you know, so it's not a big threat to your pets. Mm -hmm. Whereas other cane toad, you know, the in invasive uh, cane toad, if your dog attacks or your cat attacks, it, you know, it's going to have to be rushed to the hospital um, because it could, it could kill them pretty quickly. So that's one I example of a bad introduction, a bad biological control introduction. There wasn't a whole lot of rigorous testing of that before it was released. But we have some really good uh, potential now for uh, biological control agents. One is uh, controlling air potato. So air potato is this invasive vine species really found throughout South Florida. And um, we just introduced, I think it was in 
either the early 2000s or late 90s, a beetle, um, the leaf, the air potato leaf beetle. And it only eats air potato. Okay, so first of all, air potatoes from China. And they actually did this testing in China with the leaf beetle to make sure it wouldn't eat anything else. Mm. So it was like five years of testing or something until we said, okay, this thing looks very promising. We've released it in right around campus, actually, in Davie. You could really see its effects. If you hike through Treetops Park uh, or Pine Island Ridge, really any air potato you're going to see there is going to have tons of holes and perforations from this air potato that's, that's definitely going to town on it. And that's great because that air potato get, grows so fast and yes. it is so just dense when it just webs around uh, yes. the, the species it's growing on. So it's almost impossible to get rid of. Yeah, so removing it by hand would just be devastating. But yeah, having sending insects to the task is obviously uh, yeah. quite safe. They, their reproductive potential, could, they could uh, immediately explode to take advantage of this stuff. Yeah. And that's actually, um, when, you, when you talk about biological controls, um, that's one um, topic that actually um, following this uh, interview um, um, I'm going to have a little video um, that's featuring Ashley Good from the USDA okay. and she's talking specifically about um, the development of um, these biological control agents to try to knock down the water hyacinth like mm. I mentioned before uh, and then she's going to go through basically um, the, the procedure of that where you test all these different species and say okay you know do, are they only going to eat this? And even if that is gone, are they going to jump to something else? Are they right. going to jump to something else after that? So it really, as you said, takes a whole lot of rigorous uh, a scientific um, uh, experimentation to figure out, is this thing, it, it, am I just creating another invasive species? Am I going to have yeah. an invasive species meltdown, essentially? Yep. Another uh, cool one is uh, this forward fly that they've introduced to control fire ants. So if you've been in Florida, again, for any period of time, you probably see in Fire Ant Hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, these forward flies are parasites on them. They're really neat. They kind of hover over the ant. They drop down and quickly lay an egg right on their head. And that causes their heads to just pop off, decapitation. <laughs> it's pr pretty wild. Uh, but this forward fly, again, very specific to um, uh, two invaders, actually, the, uh, the fire ants, and then and I'm forgetting what the other one, another black invasive ant, and I forget the species, but mm. it, it seems to be working out pretty well. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. So some other ways, besides biological control agents, is actually sterilization, which is pretty neat. Uh, this is occurring up in the Great Lakes area. The sea lamprey was uh, introduced there, again, due to human impacts. You know, we open channels and locks to get us from rivers up into the Great Lakes for trading purposes. When we did that, the sea lamprey was able to get up there and invade the Great Lake area. Uh, the sea lamprey uh, typically spends its adult life out at sea and then comes into the rivers and streams to uh, mate and, and lay its eggs and, and spend its larval duration period. Usually it would head back out to sea when it matures. However, when it got into the Great Lakes, there was really no reason to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. There were large fish that these sea lampreys could parasitize, and that's what they are. They're parasitic. They usually will eat um, various fish species in the ocean. Even marine mammals and turtles can get these things attached to them. But now once they got into the Great Lakes, it was really the lake trout that they started to uh, use as a host. And so they really didn't need to, to move out to sea anymore, and they complete their whole life cycle there. Big problem, the whole lake trout industry collapsed in oh, the, yeah. uh, I think it was the 40s and 50s. And so since then, they've been trying to get rid of them. And one, they're actually doing two different forms of control there. One is a chemical control. They go into local tributaries and they release what they call a lampricide, which is essentially a pesticide that kills specifically, they say, uh, the <laughs> larvae um, of the sea lamprey. That seems to be pretty effective. And the other program that they're doing is going out, catching adult sea lamprey. They take them back into the lab and they run them through this processing unit that sterilizes the males. And then they release those males back into the Great Lakes. Cause so now they can still try to mate with females, yeah. but about half the time it's gonna be a sterilized male. It's so dogs. they're just wasting that reproductive effort. And that also seems to be cutting back their populations. They're actually doing, uh, I mean, a similar idea um, with mosquitoes. Okay. Um, because mosquitoes are obviously a, um, a very important disease vector, you mm -hmm. know, carrying awful 
uh, diseases like yellow fever, dengue, you know, sure. malaria and such, um, Zika. So we don't want these things obviously spreading. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the techniques that they're doing to try to knock down those populations or the spread of some of those particular in, uh, mosquito populations, which are also exotics or invasives. Yep, the tiger uh, mosquito probably. Yep, so what they're doing with those is they're essentially creating uh, males that have this dominant lethal gene. Uh, so it's, it's only going to be expressed in females and it actually terminates them. Mm. Where they don't get the complete development. Uh, so these males, which are you know, basically produced in the lab, um, you just simply just modify their genetics, and that's a whole other mm -hmm. conversation. <laughs> yeah. You modify their genetics, and you, you make them uh, essentially have these, these, these alleles or these genes, which are, um, when they're expressed, if you have one copy of them, it, it's going to be fatal for females. Okay. So you release a bunch of these males in the wild, and every one of their offspring, if it's a female, is going to die. If it's a male, is going to be a carrier of that gene again. So when that, mm. the sons go off and again and mate with females themselves, they're still also going to propagate this gene. So it's actually cool. been, you know, on paper and, and through certain controlled experiments in the Cayman Islands, it, it seemed to have done very effective at wiping um, uh, or knocking down the population. Mm. Uh, and they, um, there's still a lot of sort of politics and negotiating that are going on now to see whether it's going to be uh, applied in like the Florida Keys and okay. so on. But it's, they're called release uh, with dominant lethal mm -hmm. RIDL mosquitoes okay. is basically what they refer huh. to as. That's cool. I haven't heard about that one. Oh yeah, that's a cool one. Nice. And another reason that Florida is such an invasive mecca uh, has to do with trade. You know, we have some of the largest ports, most active ports in the country, if not the world, here in Florida, both Tampa, Miami, Port Everglades. Uh, where we're constantly getting ships with materials from all over the world, plants from all over the world, and of course, if you're bringing in plants, you're going to bring hitchhikers with you, you know, various reptiles. Uh, we all know about all the brown anoles around South Florida, right? The, the most common reptile you will see, uh, and it's not native. It's from Cuba. How did it get here? Well, likely just from bringing plants from Cuba here, and it just hitched a ride. Um, pretty interesting with with reptiles particularly actually now that we're talking about it we have something like 42 species of invasive uh, reptiles exotic reptiles oh. I should say uh, only 15 or 16 are actually native so you know by far way more <laughs> exotic reptiles are all over the place than uh, than the natives um, yeah, and, and those ports, again, that's one way that they can bring in materials, but another way is just through ballast water, right? So these mm -hmm. big ships, in order to kind of balance themselves out at sea, they have to take on water from wherever their initiating port is, and so when they take on that water, they're taking on larvae of different species. Sometimes just adults uh, get trapped in that ballast water. Thousands of species have been recorded in the ballast water of various ships. And of course, as they are traveling, sometimes they release some ballast water. If, if they're uh, releasing trash or garbage, they kind of need to balance that out. And then of course, when they get back into their uh, destination port, like Port of Miami, et cetera, they're gonna release all that ballast water. And so now you're just introducing a whole slew of invaders into the, the waters around here. And, and that could be a big problem too. And the ships were a big contributor to the, one of the most famous examples of invasive species was the brown tree snake, which just yes. decimated native bird species on islands mm -hmm. around the, in the Pacific. Yeah, and Guam particularly, and the, Guam. this, this uh, tree boa. Yeah, um, previous to that introduction, uh, there were no tree snakes in Guam, and they had quite a diverse uh, area of, of birds and so on. This is one of the spots that actually we have tropical rainforests in a U.S. territory and those birds had really no defensive mechanisms. They'd never even seen a snake before in the tree canopy. And so this thing systematically just traveled throughout the, the island, eating their eggs, eating the adults, and they had no really defensive mechanisms against them. And, and uh, I think something like 13 species of birds went extinct yeah. uh, once that was introduced. And, how do you control a tree snake? Really tough. They're really cryptic, really hard to see. It's not like you're going to be, you know, climbing trees and trying to hunt them. Uh, they, they actually have a really innovative way of controlling these things. Uh, last I read, they are actually parachuting 
mice and other rodents <laughs> that have Tylenol in their bodies. Uh, acetaminophen apparently is toxic to tree boas. Really? And not, not too many snakes will eat dead animals, but this tree boa will. So they're literally parachuting <laughs> these things all over the island. When they hit the tree canopy, the snakes will consume them and it does kill them. So that's kind of one of their new, very, you know, very new type of uh, control measures that seems to be working for them. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I really no appreciate this, uh, this this conversation on invasive species. Yeah. Um, I think we kind of has helped establish some basic, you know, some, some general understanding of this stuff. Yeah, and uh, just, you know, just one other thing I'd like to mention to everybody out there is that it, it is all about education and, and knowing, you know, what you're buying, what you're going to mm -hmm. put out in your garden. You know, one of the biggest impacts that you can have to help the environment is by controlling what you're putting out in your own house mm -hmm. you know and so understanding well is this an exotic species uh is it could it become invasive like you were mentioning the trader joe's example yeah, it, yeah. if you knew that was an invader you probably wouldn't buy it but not too many people understand the ecological consequences of these things and not a whole lot of uh, media attention surrounds those types of ornamental plants out there so uh, you know it's something that you should definitely consider we do have plenty of native options that that are ornamental that give you light, lots of bursts of color and so on the only problem is it's harder to find those things you have to actively uh, search for um, different types of nurseries that contain the natives but they are out there it's just a matter of, of you finding them so Oh, okay. yeah. Well, excellent. Thank you very much for yeah. all that. Yeah, you got it. All right.